Hi everyone, this is David and welcome to today's live stream on Wednesday, March 2nd. Today we're going to talk about something that you have probably sensed, but maybe haven't always found the exact words for. And that is the sense of flow. Hey, uh, Saul Met, thank you. Welcome, welcome as well. So let's talk about this sense of flow and exactly what it means in today's presentation. You know that sometimes when you're reading, the sentences really do seem to flow together. And you have this feeling that, hey, I'm really understanding this. Uh, this is really making a lot of sense to me. And you find that the reading is easy as your eyes travel through from one sentence to the next, one paragraph to, to, to the next, you find that ideas are really connecting. Well, that sense of flow does not happen by sprinkling magic pixie dust over the prose. That sense of flow comes about through a conscious effort on the part of the writer to employ the many devices of coherence. And so what I want to do today is to discuss with you these devices of coherence so that you can begin to apply them in your own writing to achieve that really sublime sense of flow where your readers are really captivated by your words, your sentences, and don't have to struggle to understand what you're writing. Okay. Namaste, Karan. Okay, let's get started. First, let's ask ourselves, oh, what is coherence? It's simply making sure that your readers know how the sentences relate to each other. Sometimes it is clear how they relate. Sometimes it is not. I think back to some uh, slideshows or some images that are, I'm sometimes sent by relatives. And these are individual images, but they have no connection. You know, it's like they're images from a family vacation. That's okay for va family vacations but it's not okay for your prose. Your, in your prose, you can't simply have a series of random pictures or random sentences. You must clearly indicate how those sentences relate to each other, and that is called coherence. So how do you achieve that coherence? You achieve it with these devices that we're going to discuss today. The first one is and all of them really, are geared toward helping make clear what connections are otherwise hidden or implied. One of your goals as a writer is to make hidden connections clear, to make implied connections clear. Let's take a look at a, at a brief example, a very brief example. Look at these two sentences. Many people say they exercise every day, but never lose weight. The only sure way to lose weight is to control what you eat. There's almost a connection in, in between there, but you don't quite know what it is. There's a kind of gap that exists. And you sometimes you can clear up that gap with a single word. Like, however, many people say they exercise every day, but never lose weight. However, the only sure way to lose weight is to control. Sometimes the connection can be more, made more clear. If you come up with a phrase, sometimes a sentence between the two. Here, many people say they exercise every day but never lose weight. Although exercising is important, look what is happening here. See the second word, exercising? Although exercising? It refers back to the previous use of the word exercise. That's a very important device that you're going to learn about in this presentation, and it's called repetition of keywords. And sometimes that same repetition can be achieved by pronouns and synonyms. But look how subtle that is. There's the word exercise in the first sentence and the word exercising in the second sentence. And it's that repetition, repetition which really indicates the close relationship between the two sentences. So that's just a taste of the things that we're going to cover today. As we go through the presentations, don't, uh, don't hesitate to ask your uh, questions. Uh, Slamet, I see that you have a question there. Please go right ahead. As you're formulating that question, uh, Slamet, I will go ahead and continue with this presentation. 
Now, what are these devices? Which one should you use? As I mentioned earlier, there are three of them. Transition words and phrases, the achieving of repetition through pronouns, synonyms, and keywords, and the device of parallelism. Let's talk about each of these. First, transition words and phrases. Sometimes the connection between the two sentences is obvious and no connection word or phrase is needed. For example, most adults can master computer basics quickly. In minutes, they can learn to see how that connection is already provided because of the relationship between the last word quickly and the first phrase in the next sentence in minutes. Both are related to time and in minutes explains what is meant by quickly. So that that relationship is already clear. There's no need to add anything. Indeed, if you do add something to it, it doesn't help. It causes wordiness. Most adults can master computer basics quickly to illustrate in just minutes. The to illustrate is completely unnecessary there. Continuing on with our discussion of this device called transition words and phrases, let's take a look at a pair of sentences that where the relationship is not necessarily explicit. Indeed, it is hidden or implicit. Most Americans, many Americans, believe the Mississippi River, that's America's longest river. The Mississippi River is the longest in the world. The Amazon River and the Nile River are almost twice as long. There's a relationship there. It's implied. It is not made clear. Add a transition word or phrase and you got it. Many Americans believe the Mississippi River is the longest in the world. On the contrary, the Amazon River and the Nile River are twice as long. So there was a relationship there. It was a relationship of contrast or opposites. And that relationship was made clear by the addition of a transitional phrase. Now, I have uh, developed a, a uh, PDF for you of all of the transition words and phrases that I can think of in English. Let me get the, uh, the URL of that. And I will put this URL in the chat window. Okay, here it is, the, uh, the URL. If you click on that URL, it should open up, a, open up a PDF that I prepared for you that lists all of the transition words and phrases that I think are most commonly used and will be of the most use to you in your uh, writing. Now, uh, Slamet is asking a question about a citation. Oh, uh, Slamet, who is an organization? So it would be referred to by it. Or you could say this organization or this UN entity. But you cannot use they because it, it must be used because who is a singular organization it must be must be referred to by a singular pronoun. But you're definitely on the right track there of using pronouns as a method of transitions. You're exactly right there. You're welcome. Okay, back to our presentation. I've divided these into four basic categories that are built around the kinds of relationships between sentences that they usually illustrate. You're welcome, Slamet. The first is examples and illustrations. We have an example sentence here. Not every player was a good sport, for example. And that is specifically for examples and illustrations. Then there are additional points. There are quite a few of these. The example sentence is, showing an addition, something showing a sequence. These also show sequence. And then the third category is to restate, summarize, or show a result. You're probably familiar with some of these. 
And then the final category, there's our sample sentence. And the final category is to show a contrast. This is one of the most common. Contrary, com contrast, opposite, disagree. All of those relationships are in this category called contrast. And again, I, I put in the link to this PDF in your chat window. Okay, so finishing up with transition words and phrases, let's also remember that these can be applied also on the paragraph level and not just the sentence level. For example, here is a paragraph. Note that in this paragraph, which is about the steps to follow when doing a motivate a meditation, that we are using the transition words and phrases for sequence, first, next, then, and finally. And there are others. If you look back on the list, you saw a lot of words that show uh, sequence, steps. And we could have just as well used first, second, third, and lastly. Lots of choices there. That's why I want you to have that PDF. Give yourself lots of choices when it comes to transition words and phrases. And here is the use of them on the paragraph level again. Uh, we have the introductory transition to go from one paragraph to the next, an addition. Then we have to illustrate, which shows an example. Then we have furthermore, which adds an additional point. And then we have finally, which shows a summary or a result. So here we have a single paragraph with uh, six sentences and four transitions. That's a good ratio. More importantly, they're all needed. They all are useful. They all serve a purpose. Okay. Now, here's another strategy of uh, using transition words and phrases, and that is the use of longer transitions. Now, these are not ones that you're going to find on a list. These are ones that you must come up with yourself. And here's what happens. Often, we know the connection in our heads, but our writing leaves out that connection that is in our heads. When we read the sentence, or sentences, I should say, when we read the sentences, they make perfect sense to us because we have the connection in our heads. But what you must do sometimes is to tease out that connection out of your head and to put it into your actual paragraph. So in this case, we have job hunting can be a tedious process of months passing without any positive interest. Job offers seem to come rolling in all at once. You could have used the single word then there. And this person does use the word then, but then adds in kind of the missing piece, the missing step. Something happened between sentence one and sentence two. That something was employers have had time to consider your qualifications. And so that missing step was put in in addition to the transition word. So don't feel like that you only have to rely on that list of transition words and phrases. There are many times when you, the writer, must supply the transition because it represents words or thoughts and ideas that are hidden in your head and not expressed on the page. Okay, next. Let's cover punctuation. But the punctuation of transition words and phrases is very, very easy. Transition words and phrases are always, hey, Michael, hey, Mike Chevalier, great to see you, man. Mike Chevalier uh, is a former student of mine, so it's great for you to come by. He's now a professional writer, so it's great to have you here, Mike. And please help me, if you will, come on in and uh, be a teacher along with me because you're certainly an excellent, excellent professional writer. And he, Michael has to edit a lot of writing and obviously has to kind of tease out those connections. Now, as I was saying, the punctuation of transition words and phrases are amazingly simple. Here's the rule. They're always, always 
set off on both sides. Can't get any more simple than that. Here we have a transitional phrase connected with a prepositional phrase that comes at the beginning of a sentence. It is set off with a comma. Here it comes in the middle of the sentence. So it is set off by two commas, one on each side. Here, the transition word or phrase comes at the beginning of a sentence after a previous sentence. And so it's set off by the period on the left and the comma on the right. Here's a, the same transitional phrase that is preceded by a semicolon that marks its boundary on the left and then a comma marks its boundary on the right. Do you see that? Whether it's a period, comma, or a semicolon, transitional phrases are always set off before and after. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. I'll put up Michael's comment. Thank you, thank you for confirming that. Now, let's go to a new device. Transition words and phrases is where we begin. And I gave you the link to the PDF that includes as many of them as I could think of in English that are most often in use. Now, we're going to go to a new technique. And that new technique is called repetition. But wait a minute, you say, I was told by my elementary school teacher, by my high school teacher, to avoid repetition. Sorry, that is bad advice. What the person meant to say is avoid too much repetition. Avoid repeating so much that it becomes ob obnoxious or seemingly unnecessary. Because I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that repetition is the most common device of coherence, the most common one. And let me illustrate that for you. Here is a paragraph about a famous incident in American history called the Lost Colony of Roanoke. Then it begins this way. The Lost Colony of Roanoke is a mystery that will never be solved. How did 117 settlers disappear? Then the remaining sentences, you see no repetition. But in reality, here's the original version of that paragraph from a history book. Yeah. See all that repetition? The mystery begins. See how that second mystery, the mystery begins, drags you along between the two sentences by referring back to the first mystery? And look at the sentence, Roanoke was deserted. The settlers had disappeared. That reaffirms or repeats why we're here in the first place. This is the key incident, and it's taking us back to it. The word clues is a way of repeating or being a part of this whole idea of mystery. And that's a repetition using a synonym of a key, key word. Sure, so Matt, see you later. No problem whatsoever. Uh, the only That was a, a post from Samet. And then we end with repeating those key words. Searches for the settlers continued for years, but their disappearance has never been explained, and the lost colony remains a mystery. Now, if any teacher tells you that's too much repetition, please give them my phone number. Because that is from a history book, <laughs> a history text, a good one. And it uses repetition to keep this focus on this sense of mystery, this, this, uh, this mystery that coalesces around these 117 settlers disappearing. Repetition is good when it is done well. Let's look at some more forms of this. There are three basic forms of repetition. The first one we're going to cover is repetition with pronouns. Any pronoun, whether it's a personal pronoun, he, she, it, I, you, they, or whether it is a demonstrative pronoun, them. Yes, let me put up Ar Arvaz, Arnav's question. Arnav Kah Kahli, Kahil, excuse me, ask. A certain level of repetition is appreciated. Yes, absolutely. And this is one of the important aspects of this presentation because so many of you come away with this generality that is hindering your writing. 
rather than helping your writing. So I hope to show you ways in which repetition is working well for you. Now, any pronoun will do. Personal, demonstrative, relative, they'll do. Now, pronouns can do two things. They can refer backwards, and that's called anaphoric, or they can re refer forward, and that's called cataphoric. Most pronouns are backwards. Many of them, however, are forwards. Here's a backwards one. It's a silly example. Major, a great Dane from Wales, is the world's largest dog. He, now that refers back to major. We continue on. Standing on his refers backwards. I'm just showing you that some pronouns refer backwards. Some, pro some pronouns refer forwards. You must remember this. What is this? I'm now going to give you the answer to it. A kiss is just a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. Famous song from the movie Casablanca. Forwards and backwards. Sometimes you get both in the same sentence. He is just a dog. He, forward. You don't know who he is until you continue reading the sentence. But Major, a great Dane from Wales. By the way, it's okay to suspend the antecedent of the pronoun just a little bit, as long as it comes very close by and serves a purpose. Stands seven feet tall, put on his back legs. He refers forward. His refers backwards. So you've got your readers coming and going there with the pronouns. Don't underestimate the power of pronouns to help you achieve coherence. Now, another important aspect of coherence is actually repeating key words and pronouns together. We saw the repetition of key words earlier. Let's take another look. Look at the words uh, great in leaders here that are used in repetition along with they. Let's read this paragraph out loud and you tell me whether it's too much. Are great leaders born or made? Regardless of the answer, most experts agree on the three qualities of great leaders. I would say that repetition is absolutely necessary to define for whom you're going to give the qualities. First and foremost, transition word or phrase showing sequence. First and foremost, they refers back to great leaders. Now, here's the subtle thing that's going on with pronouns. Pronouns are a way of manipulating your reader. Pronouns make the reader in his or her mind go back and recapture something that came previously in the paragraph. And that act of having to go back is forcing your reader's mind to play the game of coherence, logic, flow. First and foremost, they are honest, a trait which inspires trust and credibility in those being led. Second, great leaders. You couldn't get by with a pronoun there. Now we're too far away from the main reference. Great leaders are great communicators. They, we've already said great leaders, so now we can use a pronoun. They have the ability to moderate and inspire with their words. So both of those are, uh, and both of those refer backwards, cataphoric. I don't want to get too caught up in these words there. They refer backwards where the written or spoken. Finally, these leaders. So instead of re referring to that again, referring to only one of the key words together with a demonstrative pronoun, these, are able to stay focused on the big picture, the vision they strive toward and make a reality for those who follow them. So do you think there's too much repetition in that paragraph? Every sentence has an element of repetition in it. Every sentence in that paragraph. Yes, Arnav, it is highly appreciated. Okay. By the way, key words appear five times and pronouns refer four times. So we have, in that short paragraph, we have nine devices used of a five key words, four pronouns. Now, you can also achieve repetition with synonyms. That is a word that refers to the same thing as another word or approximately the, the same thing. Sometimes synonyms are a single word. Sometimes synonyms are a phrase. Let's take a look. Here you see 
synonyms. Pick out the synonyms here. The biggest retail hit of the past Christmas season was virtual reality headsets. There's your key word. Oculus Rift, PlayStation VR, Samsung Gear finally made journeys into the mainstream of 3D worlds. See how 3D, the phrase, is a synonym of virtual reality. For the uninitiated, VR, that abbreviation, is a synonym. Is an immersive experience in which your movements are tracked in a three-dimensional world. Three-dimensional is a synonym of 3D. 3D is a synonym of virtual reality. Making it seem like you actually inhabit another dimension. See how we're repeating the key word of dimension together with the pronoun, another part of the pronoun. While virtual world realities, simulations, and games have been in development since the 1990s, the Christmas of 2021 finally made this hyper-reality, another synonym, more real than Santa Claus. Every sentence in that paragraph contains either a repetition of the keyword or a synonym of the keyword. And you really don't see it until you go back and boldface them. It's repetition with key names, uh, synonyms with keywords. Now, sometimes synonyms actually summarize so here, you look at this list here. Ghosts, spirits, apparitions, souls, shades. And now we have a synonym that summarizes those entities. Below that, in the next sentence, we have another synonym phrase that summarizes them. Such phenomena. And then in the same sentence, we have a pronoun that refers back to them, cataphoric. Them, seriously. So, we have two sentences, three devices of coherence, synonyms that summarize, and pronouns that refer back. Do you see that once you start taking these things apart and looking very specifically, very granularly at the actual devices being used, they're there. Now, let's put it all together in this paragraph here. Oh, notice how cleverly uh, keywords are repeated, synonyms are used, and pronouns are there to always keep the writer, reader on track. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has designated, that's going to be one of our keywords, the rusty patched bumblebee as an endangered species. There are our keywords. Let's see how they're repeated. The first such designation. So we've got the word designated and its synonym designation. For a bumblebee, and there we have the repetition of the keyword bumblebee. For a bee species, bee is a synonym for bumblebee, and species is now repeating the keyword of species. The bees, that's, here we have the possessive bees, but it's still a device of coherence because it's a synonym of a bee and bumblebee. New status, the new uh, status is this Repetition, a synonym of new designation. The species, these bees. Then we have the Latin phrase, Bombus of Venus. The, uh, the Latin uh, uh, category there is um, a way of saying a species, a Latin way of saying it. The pronoun they in dramatic decline refers back to its endangerment. Dramatic decline is a synonym for endangered. So what one, if you go past the first sentence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten different devices, ten different repetitions in that paragraph following that first sentence. So the kinds of repetition we've studied can be put together into one paragraph, working all together. Oh, hey, Becky, great to see you as well. Becky Schmidt is a, uh, a teacher of English language and literature at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. It's great to have you here, Becky. Okay, and now finally we get to parallelism. Look at this word salad here. How do you make sense of that word salad? More importantly, how do you help your reader make sense of that word salad? Well, you can imply 
the device of parallelism on it. For example, we can put in something like, oops, sorry about that. Something like this. From the east came, from the west came, and from the south came. In other words, we put the genres in three different geographical categories and used the parallel phrase, from the east came, from the west came, from the south came. That repetition of that phrase, from the blank came, from the blank came, from the blank came, that is a parallel structure that is being repeated three times in series. Thus, it is parallel. Okay. Connecting paragraphs, sometimes you can get away with a, just as it was possible when connecting sentences, sometimes you can get away with a single transition word or phrase. However, however, there are times, just as it was in sentences, where you need to go ahead and supply that missing thought, that missing sentence, that missing connective tissue that joins the parts together, whether the parts be two sentences or whether the parts be two paragraphs. Okay, that ends the presentation. Let's see what is going on here. Becky is saying LOL here. Oh, okay, whatever. Okay. And so now I want to deal with all your questions. Now, this can be questions about what we just covered, strategies of coherence, or it can be questions about anything related to your writing. Uh, we have 20... Excuse me, we have 27 minutes. So excuse me, I will take a drink and get ready for your question. I was muted. Thank you. Okay, Becky asked, do my ESL students give me any problems with coherence? And I was, let me recap by simply saying, the ESL students who are in these chats are on the master's and doctoral level. They do an excellent job with English vocabulary and with constructing their sentences. There are only two areas that I have found that these master's and doctoral level students need to work on. And those two areas are coherence and syntax, expanding their syntax. And that's something that I'm going to be focusing on in, in the next week. Uh, in a former chat, a previous chat, Becky, I did an analysis of a doctoral student's writing I uh, forget what, he, he was studying in China, 
He was originally from, oh, I forget what nation he was from, but he was studying in China and he was working on his doctoral degree in China on, I think it was electrical engineering. Oh, excuse me. It was environmental engineering. And he had gotten a comment back from his teacher saying, I couldn't believe a teacher wrote this. The teacher said, your writing is on the high school level. Well, the student was quite upset with this, understandably. I tried to explain to the student that sometimes non-language teachers, non-writing teachers don't know how to say things. And she was actually trying to help him. And I did an analysis of his writing and some other writing and compared it to professional writing, including a professional piece published by his professor. And the primary difference I found was sentence complexity. That was the primary difference. And that is one of my goals in these chats, as well as coherence. So those are the two problems, Becky, coherence and syntactical complexity. Okay, and I'm sorry about the mute thing. Miss S. Hi, Dr. Taylor. May I know your take on the use of the word Oxford comma? Yeah, absolutely. The Oxford comma is essential and necessary in academia. The only time you uh, you leave out the Oxford comma is in journalism, nonfiction, and fiction writing. That's a very clear rule. All the style guides. Uh, Miss S, agree with that. MLA, <clears throat> excuse me, MLA, APA, Chicago, Harvard, uh, IEEE, all of them, Council of Biology editors, they all say use the Harvard comma. The only time you don't use it is in journalism. Okay, and it seems like Becky agrees with that assessment. I forgot I left out legal writing too. It's very important in all in all of those fields, especially in legal writing. Thank you for that question. Miss S, where are you from, Miss S? I think I know everyone else. A lot of the regulars who are here. I've got both Jasons, Jason Chong and Jason Catlin. Arnav, I think, is new. So Arnav, wherever you are from, I would love to hear that. Michael Chevalier is, are you still in Washington, D.C. area, Michael? Servant for the Lord, I forgot where you're from. But Servant for the Lord is a regular. Quran, a regular. From Nepal, Rama, a regular. Rama is... Studying in, I forgot where you're studying, Rama. It was someplace exotic, and I wished I was there. Misses is from the Philippines. Ah, I spent uh, I spent several years in the Philippines. Loved it. I would I would go back and retire in the Philippines immediately uh, if I could. Once the internet gets better, I, I will definitely consider it. I think it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. That's right, Jason from Barbados. I did, it's been a wonderful week in Bar Barbados once. I was uh, editor of a scuba diving magazine, got to travel all over the Caribbean and the great diving in Barbados. Becky, Michael, if you, if you find what helps you, will you share with the group? Michael wrote... As an intense reader, interpreter of academic papers, coherence and intense syntax are definitely challenges for me. Challenges for you as an editor, Michael? <clears throat> I'm assuming that's what you what you meant. Oh, Michael's in North Carolina. Okay. Uh, Becky, I, I, I can answer that a little bit. What I'm planning on doing is a series of sentence combining exercises in these chats. We're going to begin with relative clauses, then we're going to go to participles, then we're going to go through a lot of other parts of speech, and we're going to use them to combine sentences 
individual sentences in, in order to expand our syntactic base, our syntactic knowledge, our ability to use uh, these different devices in English. Yeah, yeah, Michael's an editor and a reader. Uh, does a lot of work for NASA. Oh, yeah, sure, Jason. I would love to. Unfortunately, I don't no longer have a publishing company paying me to travel. Okay, great, Becky. Uh, Becky says that she would have her ESL students watch the stream. Yeah, I'm going to do a series of lessons. Each one will, will feature a different uh, device. What are the devices? I have a list of, of them around here somewhere. I've kind of already started on the... Here's the, uh, the list, Becky. Okay, we're going to go from uh, relative clauses to participles. Participles, we're going to do a positives and then absolutes. Then we're going to focus on the different methods of subordination and coordination. Then we're going to do focus on prepositional phrases and infinitive phrases, a form of prepositional phrase. Noun substitutes. And that should take us. That should be that should be enough. Yeah, happy to happy to go through them, Becky. Um, if I had time, I, I, I wanted to do a, a, a downloadable course on it, but I just don't just don't have the time. OK, more questions, please. What are you guys doing in when you're writing? What are you working on? Time for another drink, and I'll remember to unmute myself. Miss S writes, thank you for appreciating the Philippines, Dr. Taylor. You've just helped promote the country. It is a wonderful tourist destination. Yes, and there are retirement. But the cost of living in the Philippines is, I think, like 30% of what it is in, a, in America. And uh, some of the uh, some of the islands are just incredible retirement destinations. Like I'm looking at Mindanao in the south, and you can either be close to a large city like Davao, which is the second largest city in the Philippines, and it's in its second international airport. And within 30 minutes, you can be in these uh, be out in the beautiful mountains of of Mindanao the breadbasket of the Philippines. Yeah, Jason. Yeah, you know, a Barbados, and Jason will share this, I'm sure. Barbados is very much a British island, formerly a British colony. And um, so the all the prices there are in pounds and dollars. What is the, is there a Barbadian currency, Jason? And uh, so as a result, you, you kind of expect typical European prices. Well, we're talking geography and vac retirement villages here. I'm feeling old. Give me some of your uh, substantive, sub substantive questions, please. Uh, Michael writes proposals in software engineering and read a lot of graduate work. Uh, Michael, if you have a chance to share some of those with me, I think they would make excellent examples to show during the live stream and maybe you know, do some revision work on them. Uh, and that goes for any of you who are currently writing, any of you in this chat, uh, both my Jasons, Miss S, everybody else. If you want to send me samples of your writing, I'd be happy to do a workshop on them in which we explore the different ways that you can uh, uh, level up your writing, for lack of a better, better word, uh, with these different devices that we're talking about. 
Okay, substantive questions, please. I know we have a lag. There are 11 people in the chat. So for those of you who are here, please feel free to ask any question related to writing. Jason, we have our own currency. Okay, the Barbados dollar, I remember it now. Okay, and it's tied to the US dollar. I do believe. And it's worth two US and three pounds. Strong currency. Unlike the ruble, huh, Jason? Okay. You guys are making my job very easy today. We have 11 people waiting on the other 11 to ask a question. Uh, Maryam Aguni, I, I don't think I've I've seen you before in a chat, Aguni. So where are you from? And by the way, you're 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 welcome. And anything that I can help you with, and that's one thing that you guys who are still here on the chat can do. Simply type in the chat box any topic that you would like me to cover in next week and the future weeks live live streams. So, Miriam, what are you working on? What What's another topic you would like covered that would really help you? And it, and it might be one that I've already covered, and I can re refer you to that video. Here is Miss S. Thank you for the offer to help improve our writing. You don't need much help, Miss S. You write very well. I, copy, I can tell. You copy edit academic papers. I'm wondering how you deal with academics who are not open to criticism about their writing. I don't. I really, I really don't. Some people simply do not have the right mindset to improve their own writing. And unless you have some kind of power over them, a Miss S, there's really not anything that you can do. I don't know what situation you're in. Uh, if you're doing this as a freelancer, all you can do is suggest and let them be the final judge. I mean, after all, it is their work. They have ownership of it. And so you are basically in a position, if you're doing it as a freelancer, basically you're only in the position of a coach, one who makes suggestions. After that, they have complete ownership of, of their work. Now, if you're an editor of a publication and they hope to be edited, be cop, to be published in your publication, then they must follow your edits. And if they aren't, you need to see your chief editor and say, this person's not playing along. How do you contact me privately? Cook with me. Well, I would love to talk with you, cook with me. Uh, here is my, I will put in my email address. I think it's also somewhere in the chat. Yeah, sure, cook with me. Uh, I'm happy. Why don't you go ahead and ask the question now? And if it's one that needs more depth, uh, I will do a presentation on it uh, for you and for everyone else. And I just put in my email to cook with me. I don't think I said that right. I think it's cook with me. If I'm understanding the punctuation correctly. Okay, well, we have 10 minutes left in the chat. Still waiting on substantive questions. Looks like Cook With Me has one. It's my literature too for dissertation. It's so hard. Okay. Excellent question. First, Cook With Me. 
I do need to talk to you. I need to know, I need to see your research proposal. And after looking at your research proposal, I would then be able to tell you what slant to take in your literature review. In your literature review for your dissertation, you're not writing a general literature review. You're writing what is called a critical review. And I covered it in... I forget what chat I covered it in, but when you email me and when I respond, I will give you a link to that chat. But you are writing what's called a review article or a critical literature review or a critical literature analysis. And I give very clear steps on how to write this form of a literature review. It is not a general literature review at all. Cook with me. Have you already collected your sources? That's the first question. And have you already written your proposal? If you've done those two steps, the rest is a piece of cake. That's a saying that means easy. Jason, I agree with Miss S. It's very difficult to deal with academics with writing problems. They don't want to accept it. Are you doing freelance work, Jason? Are you a teacher? Oh, okay, okay. What is the difference? Now, see, these are excellent questions for the entire group. Cook with me. What's the difference between a critical review and a normal review? In a critical review, you have a very specific slant. For example, let's say that my dis dissertation is on best practices for therapies for young adults with autism best practices, best therapeutic practices for young adults with autism. Do you see my slant there? I'm not just looking at any work. I'm only looking at work, works, excuse me. I'm only looking at works that talk about therapies for developmental autism. And more specifically, if I can find them, don't want to limit it too much, therapies for young adults. Everything else I throw away. That's all I've got to find. So first comes that slant, and then you can do your search. Okay, Cook says, I've just downloaded articles I might be using for your proposal. So now I would ask the question, what makes you think that you might use them? And I'm not being sarcastic or flippant or mean. I'm saying, you have to know what your slant is before you can know whether or not they will be of use. There should not be any might about it. You should only download articles that you know fit your specific slant. Now, do any of the instructors here want to chime in on this? This is, this is what throws off so many of people, so many of you on the master's and the doctoral level when it comes to literature review, not knowing the difference between a general literature review and a critical literature review. Saudi, thanks for your guidance, doctor. I'm a PhD scholar in education, and my problem is how to problematize your topic. First, I would, I would like to know what your topic is. And then after that, I would show you techniques for coming up with your research problem, your research questions. Once you show me that topic, I will show you a method, and I've covered it in a previous video, a previous chat. I, show, I, I will show you a method for coming up with multiple research questions to be answered in your dissertation. But first, Sadi, I need to know your topic. And if you want to email me, I'll be happy to respond to you via email. You can also respond in comments to one of my videos. Those comments come directly to me and I'm able to respond on the actual YouTube video where you made the comment. So with Cook With Me, I need to see your proposal or at least know your proposal. And Saudi, 
I need to know uh, what your topic is before I can help you problematize it. Jason, you're a musician in your state band, but I do animation as a hobby. Very interesting. My son is a is majoring in uh, animation. I was told my writing needs to improve. Really? Especially with your scripts for animation. Jason, why don't you show me? See, that's pretty general advice. Improve your writing. <laughs> uh, Jason, you need to send me uh, one or two of your scripts so I can diagnose exactly what the problems are. That's pretty general advice. <laughs> You're interested in pursuing first studies at university. That's why I tune in. Okay. And you're interested in pursuing animation, is that correct, as a major? If that's the case, I need to tell you about some very important differences between types of schools. So, Jason, whenever you go ahead and respond to that when you have a chance. Okay, here is Sadi. My topic is related to Evaluation of English textbooks at intermediate level. Tell me what you mean by related to. Is your topic eva the how to evaluate English textbooks? So it sounds like you are doing research that will help other teachers better evaluate textbooks, inter intermediate level textbooks for their students. Do I have that correct, Saudi? Yes, Jason, very general. Animation and music. Do you mean music in animation? Or do you mean music for animation? We need a, we need a pronoun, a, not a pronoun, a preposition there. Is it music in animation or music for animation? Music for animation, different curriculum, different schools. Ms. S, thank you for your advice. Academic writing is supposed to benefit the masses. Ha ha ha. However, academics tend to alienate the readers from even jargon, highfalutin words. Uh, truer words have ne'er been spoken, Ms. S. Um, acad academicians must play a game and that game is if they're students they must please their dissertation advisor who is an academician and if they are a professional they must uh, please the, uh, the publication so they're kind of caught in the middle when it comes to academic writing, there's really no writing for the masses that I know of. It is writing for academic journals. Now, if you want to translate what you've written for an academic journal into a lay journal, you're welcome to do that. And that's great. And you should be able to do that. But it's like the difference between, a, a, between the, the journal Popular Science and an academic journal on science. There are two different audiences. I, I, Ms. S., I would like to know more about your position and more about who these people are and why you are editing them. What does critical mean, sir? Yes, okay, here, here it is in a nutshell. Critical does not mean judgmental. Critical does not mean evaluation in this case. Critical means that you make a selection based upon your particular slant. I tried to illustrate, illustrate that earlier with uh, somebody writing a dissertation on therapies for young adults who have autism. In that case, my critical distinction would be between all literature on autism and what I'm looking for, which is 
therapeutic practices for young adults. You see how one is a whole and the other is just a very small part of that whole. And it sounds to me what, what you might be struggling with, cook with me, is you haven't found the critical division, the, let's use the word distinction. You haven't found the distinction between all literature on your topic and the literature only related to your proposal. Uh, I'm sorry, what, what, I'm sorry, Michael, what depends upon the audience? You're talking about the, the use of the word critical? I'm not sure there. Okay, uh, Saudi, I would certainly email you the details of my pros to get your guidance, my respects, on yourself. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Oh, okay, well, it's a little bit past time. Uh, hey, uh, Saudi, where, where are you studying? Cook with me. Where are you studying? Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm going to probably end it down. The academic right front. Yes, yeah, absolutely, Michael. We, uh, really, everything depends upon the audience, right? Uh, there's an audience when you write for academic journals, and you must write that way for them. And there's an audience when you write for lay publications, and that's a very different audience. And then you can further segment that audience depending upon the discipline in the field. Further segment that by age. I mean, it, you want to make your definition of the audience as specific as possible. Copy editor. Okay. Research-oriented at a state university. Are these people, this is very interesting to me, Ms. S. Are these people attempting to prepare their manuscripts for publication? Am I understanding you correctly there? Yes or no? Jason, I'm interested in pursuing a degree in animation. Okay, you would do those. Uh, those, be, those are two different degree programs, Jason. Or doing the same for music. But both are separate. They cross paths at times. Very sure. Film scoring and 3D modeling. Now, there are two ways that you can study animation. Because my son is majoring in animation, we have explored them all. There's the expensive way, there's the cheap way, and there's the right way. The expensive way is to play, pay this enormous tuition to the art schools. My son first tried Savannah College of the of, for Art and Design, Next, he tried the Art Academy of Art University in San Francisco. And there was no way that he was getting his money's worth at either of those schools. Each course cost $6,000. One course cost $6,000. That's the expensive way. The cheap way is simply to study at uh, uh, online using all the online programs, uh, Simple Learn, um, uh, LinkedIn Learning, used to be called uh, Linda, and you can get a you can get certificates from those. We took a more moderate approach. We found uh, universities that were not art schools and charged this enormous price, but none, nonetheless universities that had good animation programs. And so we got him at a state university with a good animation program. Yeah, there you're paying, it was about $5,000 per course, Jason. $5,000 per course. It just wasn't worth it. Yeah, I think Savannah Art, SCAD, it's called Savannah College of Art and Design. I think it's ranked number three in the nation. Academy of Art University, I think, is ranked second, third, fourth, somewhere, somewhere in there. And to me, they're just, 
ways for rich people, rich kids to spend their money. Saudi, it's from Pakistan. I have a good friend that I teach with uh, at the University of Maryland who's from Pakistan. From Pakistan, let me share that your videos have helped me a lot in refining my way of conducting. Well, that's great to hear, Saudi. That's very great to hear. Thank you very much. And that's the purpose of the whole thing, isn't it? <laughs> that's right, Jason. That's right. Way too much money. Way too much money. Now, the the upside of paying these really big fees, especially at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, is they had a direct door to all the animation studios in California. They, the animation studios would recruit directly out of Art Academy University, including Pixar. Indeed, some of my son's teachers were Pixar animators. But they were terrible teachers. <laughs> they were terrible teachers. Davy got just as much by studying on his own. As a matter of fact, to complete the assignments in the course, he had to make great use out of all the tutorials available on uh, Simple Learn, uh, LinkedIn Learning, YouTube, etc. They simply were there for the paycheck. Okay, I got to let everybody go. We're down to eight people now. Thanks, everybody, for coming by. It was a great discussion. Great meeting new people. Cook With Me is in the UK. Thank you for telling us that. Cook With Me. Cook With Me, excuse me. And I hope to see you again. Good, I'm glad you did, Jason. You don't get what you pay for when it comes to these art academies. In some majors. Michael, you're very welcome, Michael. Thank you for coming by. And I will send you guys, you and Becky, the link so you can join me as instructors. I need you. Okay, guys, I'm going to end the broadcast. See you later. Check out the video will be uploaded as soon as I click end broadcast. See you, Miss S.